Good morning, all. Thank you for, I guess, good afternoon now. It's 12.01. Thank you all for being with us today. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're here in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Join us tomorrow evening from 5 to 7 here at the museums for the latest installment of History Happy Hour, which will focus on photography in Mississippi history and feature free admission to the museums, live entertainment, refreshments, and a cash bar. You can find details on the museum's social media pages. And then this Saturday, June 26th, is the final day for the Mississippi Distilled Prohibition, Piety, and Politics special exhibit. So if you haven't seen that, or if you want to see it one last time before it goes, come by Saturday. And then join us here next week for History's Lunch when Deanne Stevens will discuss her new University Press of Mississippi book, The Mississippi Gulf Coast Seafood Industry, A People's History. Today, we're delighted to have Robert Hunt Ferguson with us to present Remaking Race and Labor in Rural Mississippi, The Saga of Providence Cooperative Farm. Robert Hunt Ferguson is an associate professor of history at Western Carolina University. He earned his BA and MA from Western Carolina University and his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is the author of the University of Georgia Press book, Race and the Remaking of the Rural South, Interracialism, Christian Socialism, and Cooperative Farming in Jim Crow, Mississippi. Help me welcome Rob Ferguson. Thanks for coming today, everybody. Uh, and thanks to Chris Goodwin and the Mississippi Department of Archives and History for having me today. Uh, I was originally scheduled to give this talk sometime last year, uh, but like a lot of things this past year, that was disrupted. Uh, and so thanks to Chris especially for being so uh, flexible and getting me back on the schedule. It's uh, been a little bit since I've revisited this topic that I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Um, this was uh, originally my, my dissertation topic when I was in graduate school. And in preparing for today, I remembered that I um, had had memorized a cursory version of this topic, uh, the longer topic that I'm going to talk about today. Because when we were in graduate school, one of the first trials that they put us through was the formulation of an elevator speech. Uh, a lot of different professions have a version of this. For us, it meant that if we were at an academic conference and we were sharing an elevator with, say, the preeminent historian in our field, then we had to effectively and succinctly convey our topic and our argument to her before she got off at the next stop. Uh, as you imagine, this was painful for everyone involved, um, especially the unwitting historians who were just minding their own business on the elevator. Um, <laughs> But I would sometimes practice this elevator speech with my most patient friends. And um, I think it's important to note that some of these friends were lifelong residents of the South. And some of them were recent transplants who didn't have a whole lot of experience with the region. But their reactions were, um, were very similar. And I noticed some similarities in how they reacted. Um, they reacted often with incredulity. They couldn't really believe what I was saying to them, and typically their responses sounded something like this. So you're telling me that a group of socialists, Christian missionaries, labor unionists, student radicals, and dirt-poor sharecroppers started what amounted to two utopian, racially integrated communities in the 1930s, preaching socialist egalitarianism, racial harmony, and this all happened in the midst of anti-communist witch hunts in Jim Crow era Mississippi. Now at the time I was in my late 20s and typically all I could muster was, yeah, isn't it cool? <laughs> what I eventually understood was what historian Jacqueline Hall reminds us, that history, especially civil rights history, should be harder to celebrate as a natural progression of American values harder to cast as a satisfying morality tale, and most of all, harder to simplify, appropriate, and contain. So the saga that I'm going to share with you today happened in a time and place when socialism, Christian realism, and interracial cooperation were viable options for the downtrodden, 
when they attempted to seize control of their lives. And yes, that time and place was Jim Crow, Mississippi. Uh, one last aside, and I promise it has to do with what I'm talking about today. Um, uh, I'm really pleased that one of my closest and dearest friends is in the audience today. Uh, her name is Katie. She grew up here in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and she's a very successful novelist. And one of the things that she's incredibly adept at doing as a writer is playing with uh, narrative structure, telling stories in often um, surprising, unexpected ways. And so an homage to my friend, today I'm going to begin near the end. <laughs> On the morning of September 26, 1955, Curtis Freeman, an African-American 19-year-old young man, was riding in the back of a pickup truck with three black teenage friends near Chula, Mississippi. Only three days had passed since the acquittal of Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam, the two white men accused of murdering 14-year-old Emmett Till near Money, Mississippi, only 35 miles north of Chula. As you all know, Bryant and Milam claimed that Till had somehow flirted with and then Wolf whistled toward Bryant's wife. The all-white jury delivered a not guilty verdict for the two men only after an hour of deliberation. The news was still fresh to all Mississippians. As the truck carrying Freeman passed a bus stop along Highway 49, Mary Ellen Henderson, a 10-year-old white girl, stood waiting for her school bus. As Henderson waited with other students of various ages, the truck motored by and Freeman apparently transgressed the same line that had supposedly justified Till's fate in the minds of many white Southerners. In the general direction of students waiting at the bus stop, Freeman yelled out, Hey, sugar, you look good to me. Henderson assumed the flirtatious statement had been meant for her and began crying. Henderson told her bus driver about the comment. The bus driver told the principal, and the principal called the sheriff. Within an hour, Curtis Freeman and his friends had been apprehended by deputies. The incident shaped Freeman's immediate future. He was accused of uttering vulgarities in the company of a white woman. That is the exact charge he was, uh, the exact phrase he was charged with, and sentenced to six months of hard labor on the Holmes County penal farm. But this incident also marked the beginning of the end for a 20-year endeavor to overturn the economic and racially motivated injustices that kept sharecroppers at the bottom of Southern society. What started at Delta Cooperative Farm in Bolivar County in 1936 and migrated to Providence Farm in Holmes County in the late 1930s was about to come to a contentious and unceremonious end. Delta and Providence Farms would have never existed without the clashing of two opposing forces, the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. The AAA was a 1933 piece of New Deal legislation that aimed to level out wildly fluctuating crop prices in the midst of the Great Depression. In this part of the country, it paid farmers to remove portions of their land out of production. Plantation owners, in turn, uh, evicted and fired many of their sharecroppers. The evicted croppers, having no place to go, erected tent communities. The largest of these communities were in Missouri and Arkansas along the Mississippi River. The Southern Tenant Farmers Union, founded in 1934 in Tyranza, Arkansas, devoted some of their early focus to finding relief for the evicted sharecroppers. Three men were most instrumental to what happened next, William Amberson, Sam Franklin, and Sherwood Eddy. Amberson was a Harvard-trained physiologist employed by the University of Tennessee Medical School in Memphis. A dyed-in-the-wool socialist since the late 1920s, Amberson had worked closely with the Unemployed Citizens Brigade in Memphis and helped the Southern Tenant Farmers Union organize across the Mississippi River in Arkansas. Amberson's passion for aiding the destitute made him a beneficial ally and a stubborn enemy. Now, lots of concerned Southerners wondered what to do about sharecroppers in the wake of the AAA debacle. In the spring of 1936, Amberson traveled to Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, for the second meeting of the Southern Policy Committee, 
which was a uh, politically liberal, purely advisory body uh, that hoped to shape the direction of Southern politics and labor practices. Some of the most influential Southerners of the Depression era, including the literary cohort known as the Vanderbilt Agrarians, represented most vocally at this meeting by, Amberson, or by uh, Alan Tate, were present. Discussions centered on the debate over small, self-sufficient homesteads versus large cooperative farms as the most viable livelihood for ex-sharecroppers. The Nashville agrarians favored small, individually owned homesteads. Their vision was a lot like Jefferson's vision for the yeoman farmer. While the Southern Tenant Farmers Union favored plantation-sized cooperatives. The debate was often heated. The intellectual confrontation between Tate and Amberson that occurred at the meeting led one attendee to later write that it was the end of Southern agrarianism, which had sought to turn back the pre-Civil War days of moonlight and magnolias. In a clash of ideology and practicality, Amberson discredited Tate's romantic notions of the agrarian lifestyle as pretty poetry foolishness and nothing but a plan to reduce the people to peasantry. Amberson argued that the individual homesteads advocated by the agrarians were unsustainable in the present economy in a naive throwback to the golden age of the republic. The big planter across the road, declared Amberson, with his tractor and four-row four equipment and his superior credit facilities, cultivates his cotton at $5 an acre, while the mule dragging a half-row plow runs the bill up to over $14. The frontier is gone, he thundered. It is gone not only vertically, but horizontally. There was, Amberson suggested, a middle way for the agricultural South, steering between plantation exploitation on the one hand and the efficiency of small homesteads on the other. Amberson's middle way meant large-scale cooperative farming ventures. In response, all Tate could muster were feeble attempts to paint Amberson as a communist. By the end of the impromptu debate, Amberson had won over the Southern Policy Committee and they endorsed large cooperatives over small homesteads. The debate at the Lookout Mountain meeting further confirmed to Amberson and his reform-minded circle that they were riding a tide of activism attempting to remake Southern society. But aside from Amberson's persuasive debating skills, his biggest asset was that he knew hundreds of share sharecroppers. In short, Amberson could organize. He enlisted the help of a missionary recently returned from working in agricultural cooperatives in Japan. Sam Franklin was a Presbyterian missionary from Maryville, Tennessee, who had briefly studied at Union Theological Seminary, where he took classes with Reinhold Niebuhr. In Franklin, Amberson had found someone who could bring practical knowledge to an agricultural cooperative. He would become the first manager at Delta Cooperative Farm. Franklin considered himself a socialist, but was not an ideologue like Amberson. He was much more influenced by the tutelage of Niebuhr and a missionary named Sherwood Eddy. Eddy had befriended Franklin in Japan and encouraged him to take classes with Niebuhr at Union. Eddy, a Harvard, Princeton, and Union Theological Seminary educated theologian, was director of missions for the YMCA and traveled the world seeing firsthand the horrors of poverty and war. Just before he turned his attention to the plight of sharecroppers in 1936, Eddie promised to seek by every reform the improvement of the lot of the workers and farmers, the employed and unemployed, and to begin to build here and now a new social order, using every possible means of education and coercion short of the destruction of life by war, whether civil or international. These three men combined socialist ideology with what Reinhold Niebuhr called Christian realism. Now all they needed to do was secure the land and relocate the sharecroppers. These two tasks happened with surprising swiftness. Eddie located over 2,000 acres in Bolivar County and purchased the land outright. Amberson directed Franklin to the most destitute tent colonies, and Franklin selected families to move to the newly christened Delta Cooperative Farm. In the winter of 1936, Sam Franklin carried the cooperative idea to starving and destitute sharecroppers. By visiting them, Franklin was setting in motion events that would confront many of the social and economic issues facing the poorest laborers in the nation. 
Franklin hoped these families would be the vanguard of socialist farmers who would remake the South. Threatened with destitution, starvation, and violence, the families who resided at Delta by April of 1936 came from the ruins of the AAA calamity. Benny Fleming, his pregnant wife, and their young child were the first family to accept Franklin's invitation. Fleming, the president of a Southern Tenant Farmers Union local in Arkansas, was evicted by the plantation owner and threatened by local officials with sudden pneumonia if he did not give up his union affiliation. Sudden pneumonia was a very common phrase at the time in, in this place. Uh, it was a euphemism for uh, lynching. Instead, Franklin and the union gave Fleming a chance to start anew at Delta. After only a few months on the farm, he became a transformed man, noticed Sam Franklin, again holding his head erect and unafraid. White sharecropper Jim Henderson's stubborn nature had served him well on a plantation where, he said, both Negro and white workers were in the habit of being taken to the barn for beatings when the boss man was displeased. Like Fleming, Henderson had been threatened with murder unless he quit his affiliation with the Union. Instead of acquiescing, Henderson grabbed his shotgun and stood guard while Union members helped him load all of his belongings into a truck bound for Delta Cooperative Farm. While interviewing a female sharecropper about the recent death of a Union member, Sam Franklin was approached by a pistol-brandishing pistol plantation owner and ordered to leave because the planter believed he was interfering with labor. When Franklin simply said he was doing his duty as a Christian minister, the planter ended the conversation by proclaiming, I'd shoot you if you was Jesus Christ himself. By the summer of 1936, roughly 20 families were now living at Delta. In that first year, cooperative members built a school, a church, and a community building which hosted, hosted social gatherings such as films and dances. Residents shopped at the cooperative store and lived in newly built four-room homes with indoor plumbing and screened windows. The daily lives of residents and staff were a lot like the lives of any community in America. They fell in love, raised children, celebrated weddings and birthdays, and suffered sicknesses and deaths. The first wedding at Delta took place in January 1937 between the children of two white refugee sharecropping families, the Hendersons and the Moody's. Newlyweds Shirley and Jim Henderson Jr. and their extended families would be longtime members of the cooperative. Despite the lofty idealism, racial egalitarianism sometimes proved difficult at Delta. Farm managers were often their own worst enemies. At times, the staff and volunteers could pursue their endeavor with imprudent paternalistic behavior. They believed they knew best how to improve the lives of sharecroppers. Many residents clashed, clashed with Sam Franklin and sometimes with each other. Only two years after the farm was founded, residents began leaving in droves. <coughs> By early 1938, Sherwood Eddy decided to purchase another tract of land in Holmes County so that more ex-sharecroppers could be accommodated. Gradually, the staff and residents at Delta viewed the newly purchased 2,882-acre plot called Providence as a fresh start. The onset of World War II further altered the nature of the farms. As jobs for whites opened up in the burgeoning war industry, as agriculture mechanized and as all operations increasingly relocated from Delta to Providence, the endeavor transformed from an interracial agricultural cooperative to a collective community concerned mainly with black uplift. Sam Franklin became the new manager at Providence, but then soon left to accept a chaplaincy in the Navy. William Amberson resigned as farm advisor in a 20-page letter that he insisted on reading out loud at a board meeting. And Sherwood Eddy drastically reduced his involvement in the farm. Luckily for Providence, three new and capable leaders stepped in to take their places. A white missionary who had served as Delta's accountant, Eugene Cox, a white medical doctor and military veteran named David Minter, and Fanny Booker, an African-American woman who had come to Providence to teach after she was fired from her Mississippi public school job when she voiced her support for black voting rights. 
Under the leadership of Cox, Mentor, and Booker, Providence was a community reborn. One of the successful early initiatives was a summer health clinic staffed by the African American sisters of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated that treated everything from gout to dental hygiene. The cooperative also began a year-round clinic that employed Dr. Mentor, one black nurse and one white nurse. Its waiting room was integrated, perhaps the only one in Mississippi at the time. The cooperative also opened a federal credit union, and I always want to emphasize how important this was for the residents and the people who lived around Providence. Um, they could get a, f a fair rate on loans at this credit union. Typically, before this opened, they would have to go to a planter to get a loan, and that was a perilous exercise. Educational institutes for black ministers, summer camps for black children, and college preparatory classes for black teenagers became the focus at Providence by the early 1940s. By that time, 85% of the residents were African American. In 1941, Delta Cooperative Farm was parceled off and sold. The cooperative effort had changed at Providence, but the outside world had changed too. As many white Southerners saw it, the twin scourges of integration and communist subversion threatened their communities. Within this context, the collective reaction to a flirtatious comment, hey sugar, you look good to me, destroyed a community. As the truck carrying Freeman passed the school bus along Highway 49 near Providence Farm, Mary Ellen Henderson, the 10-year-old daughter of Jim and Shirley Henderson, was waiting to catch her bus to school in Chula. The Hendersons lived on Providence Farm and had been among the inaugural residents of Delta Cooperative Farm in 1936. Shirley Henderson's father, J. H. Moody, had been a committed socialist and follower of perennial socialist presidential candidate Norman Thomas. Jim Henderson's father, also named Jim, was an organizer for the biracial Southern Tenant Farmers Union in the 1930s and had stood guard with his shotgun while his belongings were loaded into a truck bound for Delta Cooperative Farm. When Sam Franklin traveled to uh, the Delta in 1936 looking for families who were in perilous conditions and who would, be, uh, would make ideal residents and an intentional interracial community, he chose the Moody's and the Hendersons among the first dozen families. Shirley Moody and the younger Jim Henderson met at Delta Farm in 1936 and were quickly married. Throughout their stay at Delta in Providence, the Hendersons and the Moody's prospered and displayed an eagerness to engage in the interracial endeavors of the farm. Still, their lives were not without tragedy. Jim and Shirley were pregnant often, losing several children in childbirth or at young ages. In 1945, their young son, Donald, was hit by a car and killed. Still, they raised nine children. But when a black teenager apparently flirted with Jim and Shirley's daughter, Mary Ellen, the limits of Providence's interracialism surfaced. Why Freeman's comment upset Henderson, a girl who had grown up on a farm that was dedicated to black self-help and interracial cooperation, is unclear. Maybe it was the fact that she was white and he was black that most upset her, or maybe it was the unwanted flirtation of an older boy that caused her reaction. Either way, what happened in the next few hours proved to be the undoing of Providence and its near 20-year promotion of economic and racial equality. In another context, or another decade, the incident with Freeman and Henderson might not have had the impact on Providence Farm or its residents. But by the fall of 1955, rampant anti-communism and white massive resistance to the civil rights movement had altered the terrain of race relations and hardened the resolve of many white segregationists in Holmes County. In May 1954, the United States Supreme Court handed down the Brown v. Board decision ruling that public school segregation was unconstitutional. Less than two months after the Supreme Court's verdict, Robert Patterson formed the first White Citizens Council in Indianola, Mississippi. Patterson's group targeted, quote-unquote, respectable white individuals, mainly middle-class professionals and business owners, who could block desegregation in the civil rights movement through political and economic pressure. Only days after Patterson convened the first Citizens Council, a second was chartered in Holmes County, making it a hub for the fight against black civil rights. 
After the Supreme Court decision, Gene Cox noticed that, quote, tensions, rumors, and suspicions have been multiplied about Providence Farm. Citizens Council members, some of the leading businessmen and politicians in Holmes County, spread rumors about Providence's racial politics and perceived ties to communism. What Cox called a smear campaign included a rumor that either he or Dr. David Minter had been arrested by the Federal Bureau of Investigation as, quote, red spies. Because of these accusations, Dr. Minter was asked to leave his church in Chula, where he was a deacon. Minter was devastated by his excommunication. To this son of a Pres Presbyterian minister and brother of two missionaries, remembered one friend, this dismissal came as a very great shock. A friend informed Eugene Cox in September of 54 that he had been approached by a private investigator in Jackson who had been hired to look into Cox's subversive activities. It is very difficult to prove you are not a communist, lamented a frustrated Cox, when people are not aware of just what constitutes communism. During the interrogation of Curtis Freeman and his three friends, Freeman was quick to say that when he yelled out from the back of the truck, he was speaking to a friend, a female African-American teenager also waiting at the bus stop. But the sheriff seemed mostly interested in something else. He asked questions about Providence Farm, Gene Cox, David Minter, and Fanny Booker. All four teenagers had spent time on Providence. Their parents shopped at the cooperative store, patronized the credit union, came to the educational and religious institutes, and visited the medical clinic. Did Mr. Cox talk about integration? Did Dr. Minter ever mention communism? Did the Booker woman encourage blacks to register to vote? Did interracial swimming occur at the swimming hole? The teenagers answered variously, but most said they did not know what went on at the farm. After intense questioning, the sheriff concluded that those in charge of Providence had broken Mississippi state laws by holding the communist line, quote unquote, and promoting integration. The sheriff called an emergency community meeting for the following evening. Gene Cox, David Minter, and Fanny Booker were among the last to receive word about the meeting. Cox assumed it would be more of the same accusations they had been hearing for years, and he and Minter decided to attend in order to defend themselves in person. Booker, knowing she would be the only African-American person there, did not attend. In any way, it was a segregated event. Cox and Minter were shocked when they arrived at the auditorium. Around 500 people, about half of the white population of Chula, showed up to hear the recorded confession of the four black teenagers and to listen to Cox and Minter defend themselves. The two were subjected to a barrage of questions from the conveners and attendees. They attempted to answer accusations that they had, been bro that they had broken the law, but instead were shouted down by more accusations of communism and race mixing. Upon being pressed about his opinions on school integration, Cox finally replied that he believed segregation to be unchristian. A red-faced neighbor yelled back that this isn't a Christian meeting. One person stepped forward to defend the men, Marsh Calloway, a local Presbyterian minister. He questioned both the legality and morality of the mass meeting. A chorus of boos cascaded down upon Calloway. Two weeks later, Calloway slinked away from Holmes County, having been told by his congregation that they did not agree with his support of Cox and Minter and no longer wanted his services. Finally, the sheriff called for a vote demanding that Cox and Minter leave the county. The vote for them to leave their homes of almost two decades was nearly unanimous. Only Cox, Minter, Calloway, and a local blacksmith who believed he needed more time to pray on the question voted in favor of allowing the men and their families to stay. The rest, perhaps swayed by their own convictions of white supremacy and anti-communism, or convinced by hearing their county leaders call Cox's and Minter's actions into question, agreed that the men should leave. As they left the meeting, Cox and Minter walked out of the school behind Chula resident Jeffrey T.J. Bogue. The elderly Bogue was a well-known member of the Chula commu community whose life was not unlike other well-to-do Chula residents. 
Vogue's wife was an active member of the Chula Baptist Church. They had successful children, one of whom was a superintendent of a consolidated school system in Mississippi. Vogue had grandchildren. He lavished with gifts and extravagant birthday parties. Exactly a year before the mass meeting at the Chula High School, Vogue received the awful news that a granddaughter who lived in Greenwood had contracted polio. Had his granddaughter lived in Chula, she might have been treated by Dr. Minter. Had they gone to the same church, Minter and Cox might have personally comforted Bogue about his granddaughter's illness. But T.J. Bogue was not the sort of man who associated with Providence residents. As Bogue filed out in front of Cox and Minter and approached three of his friends, he bellowed. What we need for these SOBs is a couple of grass ropes. Cox and Minter kept walking, trying not to react to the threat of lynching. I really think they would have killed us, Minter later recalled, except for the school children. Just about the time the vote was being taken on telling us to leave the state, Minter remembered, the football game ended and there were kids all over the schoolyard. Cox, Minter, and Booker initially refused to leave. Then the Citizens Council boycotted the farm store and plantation owners warned their sharecroppers not to do business at the credit union. The Sheriff's Department, with the unofficial help of armed Klansmen, conducted a 24-hour license check on the only road going into and out of the farm. All finances tied to the farm suffered. Mentor lost most of his patients, despite one African-American gentleman who showed up with his sick wife on one arm and a shotgun cradled in the other. When Minter expressed surprise at seeing the couple, the man said, I'd have kept this meeting if I had to shoot my way in. Before he left, he settled all his debts with the clinic, and turning to Minter, he said, I thought you could use some traveling money. Nightly phone calls from anonymous, belligerent neighbors threatened Gene Cox's wife and two adopted daughters with violence. Mentor was unnerved when his insurance company called to say that they had canceled the fire insurance for his clinic and home. One afternoon at the Chula Bank, a hostile neighbor approached Mentor and not only acknowledged, uh, not only had knowledge of his canceled fire insurance policy, but not so subtly suggested that if an arson were to set fire to his home, he might have time to get his wife and children out, but what about his invalid mother? Providence Farm, in the end, could not overcome the crippling boycott from the White Citizens Council and nightly threats of violence, given teeth by the presence of armed Klansmen at the end of the road. The last three remaining white families, the Hendersons, the Coxes, and the Mentors, left Providence in 1956 and never returned to live in Mississippi. Eugene Cox moved with his family to a suburb of Memphis named Whitehaven, a name they found to be tragically ironic. Cox continued his union affiliations and civil rights activism. The clandestine Mississippi Sovereignty Commission opened up an extensive investigation into Cox even after he left the state. Cox grew chronically paranoid after his experience of Providence and when several Sovereignty Commission investigators confronted him about his activities in the state. On December 14, 1992, Cox and his wife, who he had met at Delta Cooperative Farm over 50 years before, sat in their living room and chatted, as they did every night. In the evening, while we were talking, Gene suddenly slumped over, his wife remembered. He had suffered a massive stroke. He died five days later. At his funeral, the pastor of Cox's church recalled how since leaving college to join Delta Cooperative Farm and then Providence, Cox had taken his ministry to the trenches. One of the moments of solace that Cox's widow could take from her husband's death was that all those racists who hounded him for years and caused him so much paranoia and pain can no longer hurt my husband. After 1956, Fanny Booker stayed on the farm and attempted to maintain uh, community education initiatives and her summer camp. Well-placed, subtle suggestions of reprisal by whites if African Americans continued to frequent the farm, kept many students and campers away. Still, Booker managed to offer summer camps for increasingly fewer youth into the 1970s. 
For the rest of her life, Booker stayed in Holmes County and became involved with promoting black-owned and operated businesses, including a string of community pride grocery stores, a home for the elderly, and a museum celebrating black history in Holmes County. She also became intensely involved with the Holmes County Head Start program and with voter registration drives after the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965. In the 1967 election, Booker supported a black Holmes County teacher named Robert Clark to represent her county in the state legislature. Clark defeated an incumbent white politician who had helped lead the eviction of Gene Cox and David Minter from the county 12 years prior. In doing so, Booker had helped elect the first African American to the Mississippi legislature since Reconstruction. The Mississippi Sovereignty Commission briefly targeted Booker as well. An investigator visited the cooperative store and inquired about Booker, the farm, and Gene Cox. He condescendingly referred to Booker as, quote, above the average Negro in intelligence. Booker did not trust the man and answered his questions with curt responses. He left frustrated. After 1967, Booker kept the old cooperative store open only one hour each day before finally closing it for good in 1971. In February of 1997, Fanny Thomas Booker died in Lexington, Mississippi. Hundreds of her former campers and students attended her funeral. The spaces at Delta and Providence represented an endless threshold. Residents always seemed on the verge of ushering in new racial and economic alternatives to Southern society. Put another way, the ex-sharecroppers were in a state of perpetual transition. But that cannot persist indefinitely. The little upheavals and seemingly minor day-to-day -day events that took place at the farms and the backlash from outsiders were the rumblings of the clashes between the plantation mentality of the Old South and the as yet uncharted territory of the modern South. In the end, Providence's failure was a tragic contingency of history. But the simple fact that the cooperatives existed at all made them extraordinary. From 1936 until 1956, Delta and Providence provided opportunities for hundreds of destitute rural Southerners, particularly African Americans, to pursue avenues for racial and economic equality. A socialized economy, cooperative buying and selling power, and a credit union that offered fair loan rates provided Bolivar and Holmes County residents some economic stability. Health and medical services provided by nurses, doctors, and the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority summer health clinics markedly improved the lives of hundreds of rural Mississippians. Educational initiatives in academics, agriculture, and Christianity prepared students for a life in a changing South as more Southerners moved off the land, attended college, and became involved in the political process. As one African-American resident at Providence stated, I never heard of democracy until the last four years when I moved here. Delta and Providence stood as testimony, as a New Republic journalist noted, of the essential bravery and vitality of human beings that are always to be remembered. And I hope it is being remembered. In 2008, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History placed this historical marker at Providence. Yet how often is this part of the South's history ignored, or as Jacqueline Hall warned, appropriated and contained? For proof of appropriation, we can look to how Dr. Minter was remembered in Holmes County 15 years after leaving Providence. Minter and his family had moved to Tucson, where he had set up a clinic for migrant workers and continued his community activism. In 1969, Mentor was honored by his Tucson community for, quote, significant achievement in patient care and health services. A Holmes County newspaper picked up the story and ran an article on Mentor, complete with a large picture of the doctor. The newspaper flatteringly recalled how Mentor was still remembered with love and affection by hundreds of his friends and patients in the county. That part is true. Yet in a bewildering display of appropriation, the article listed among Minter's many medical and community service honors that in September of 1955, he was honored at recognition night of the Holmes County Community Council. The recognition night the article mentioned was, in fact, the night hundreds of Minter's neighbors voted him out of the county and some threatened him with lynching. 
The history of Providence Farm is hard. It's hard to cast at a, as a satisfying morality tale, hard to simplify, hard to contain. It is easier to forget than to remember. Perhaps former Delta and Providence resident Esther Lou Moody phrased it best. In a 1966 letter to Gene Cox, Moody confided, the kids and I go back over the old days quite often and try to put all the nice things in front of all the heartaches. Thanks very much. And I, I believe we're going to have some time for Q&A. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. I'll get you next. That newspaper article at the very end, mm -hmm. now wasn't that when Hazel Brandon Smith was the editor? I think she's being sarcastic. <laughs> I think she, know, she knows what she's saying right in that last sentence. That could be, and you're exactly right. She is the editor um, at this time. Uh, um, that, that very well could be, and she was known for turning the screws. Um, yes, that's, that's entirely possible. Yeah. Was there any relationship at all between the leadership of Providence Farm and the leadership of the Milestone Co-op? Um, there was some communication. Um, there in the archives, there are letters between the two farms. Um, there seems to always be, not only with Milestone, but some other cooperatives in Mississippi and in Louisiana at the time, um, potential plans to do something uh, specific. And it seems like those plans never actually you know, take place. Yes, absolutely. Um, and some of the, uh, so after m most folks move off to the cooperative in 1956, some actually relocate to Milestone. I was going to ask you about the Southern Regional Policy hmm. Group. Have they? Uh, how long did they continue to operate, or did they uh, foster any other kind of agricultural experiments or changes in ag policy or anything? What a great question! I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I've you know I've only read about the Southern Policy uh, Council in. Um, uh, and books that other folks have written. And um, typically, the way that the historians typically interpret um, that, that council is that they are full of ideas and not a whole lot of follow through. Um, there, and, and that's kind of how I wrote about it in the book. There's a lot of debate typically in those meetings um, and a lot of lofty ideas and not a ton of follow through. And that's what made Amberson a little bit different than some of the folks who attended the, the committee meetings. Um, but that's the extent of my knowledge of the SPC. I'm sorry, I can't answer that further. Thank you, Rob, what a great talk. Um, I am wondering if uh, these farms, these cooperative farms, were not only a racial and political threat to people in the area, mm. but also an economic threat. Was it a mono-agricultural product that was being put forth that was threatening to the uh, economic well-doing, you know, welfare of the farmers in the area, or was it not well, that extent? What an interesting question. Um, they, they, were, they did not practice mono-agriculture. They diversified their crops. Um, especially uh, in the, after World War II, they diversified. Um, they, so far as I can tell, they really weren't, um, they didn't really challenge the local economy. They didn't really compete with plantation owners directly. Um, but the challenge they did pose was drawing some sharecroppers off of plantations. Um, those who wanted to move and those who had space at Providence um, and Delta before that. And so in that way, they challenged the economic supremacy of some of the plantations. Um, but what Providence was really adept at, what Gene Cox was really good at, was setting up um, uh, relationships with uh, places that he could sell their crops to. They also had a dairy. Um, and they sold their milk to um, an organization in Mississippi that then got their milk out to um, the area. Um, so they, they signed a lot of contracts with people they could sell their, their crops to. Um, 
and, and weren't really competing in the local Holmes County um, economy with other planters. Yeah. Thanks. We got another few questions here, but we also have some questions and comments from the live stream. Um, since you mentioned Gene Cox, Dee Dee Baldwin at Mississippi State says that um, his papers are at the library at Mississippi State for folks who are interested in that. And uh, one of the fun things that has been happening each week is folks have sort of self-reported where they're watching from. So we've got folks from across the state, we've got Alabama, and we've got Japan. Fantastic. I, can I interject really quickly and say that, that Sam Franklin lived in Japan for a long time um, and was extremely influenced. Whoever's watching from Japan, you may know the name Kagawa. Um, he was very interest, uh, influenced by um, one of the leading uh, developers of cooperatives in Japan. So, please. Rob, that was, that was very enlightening. And I'd like to um, address that issue about uh, the socialists versus the yeoman farmer uh, advocates. <clears throat> because the government was involved in all of this at a national level, and the earliest, well, Milestone, one of the earliest resettlement mm -hmm. com communities, um, obviously was, was done at the, under the aegis of the federal government. And they purchased, the government purchased the area in Milestown and resettled sharecroppers on it and promoted this cooperative ideal. But after the Bankhead Act in 36, uh, 37, uh, the objections to the cooperative and communal aspects of the resettlement program uh, caused the government to back off from that. And <clears throat> in its place, they instituted something called the Tenant Purchase Program, hmm. which did in fact do what the human farmers uh, uh, thought was the, the, the right path. They brokered the purchase of small farms, 100 acres roughly, and they helped the uh, farmers with, well, sharecroppers to move onto those plots. They would buy a plantation and divide it up, or they wouldn't buy it. They would divide up a plantation and sell the individual pieces the, uh, the owners would be encouraged to sell the individual pieces to former sharecroppers. And there was a whole bureaucratic uh, mechanism that chose the people and uh, created the, the cash to give them 40-year uh, mortgages at 1%. Um, a lot of people have criticized that program as having um, creamed the top of the black and white agricultural sharecroppers. Uh, but I was able to study the tenant purchase program in Claiborne County, south of Jackson, and found that it was, although the, the farms were not really able to sustain themselves particularly well in competition with all the changes in southern agriculture. But they did a tremendous job at wealth creation for the black, particularly the black tenant farmers. Um, it's only 24 to 30 families who participated in, in Claiborne County. But they became almost a, a kind of um, sub-aristocracy, if mm -hmm. you will, because they owned their land. They were able to sell it in pieces, they were able to donate it to the, uh, their friends and, uh, and family. And that, um, I think, you know, the, the, there's still a lot of thing, things to be said about the creation of wealth for an underclass, uh, especially when they're doing it with some assistance, but basically as, the, as their own agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I, um, the, as I said a minute ago, the, the debate that's happening in the 1930s is, is, is happening kind of all over the country, but especially in the South. It's not just the SPC, and it's not just the, 
the Roosevelt administration, first with the resettlement administration, then the Farm Security administration. Um, but, you know, they're seeing photographs of, of sharecroppers in these tent communities and wondering what in the world can we do. Um, and this goes back to Elisa's question. I think the, the, the major impact of these communities was really on the local community, not necessarily um, on the larger economy. Uh, because this is also the time when agribusiness is really swooping in all across the country and vertically integrating agriculture and large plantations are, are even swept up in that agribusiness and small, small farmers don't have a chance. And so I think the major impact and the astounding impact is really on the local communities. Um, I was speaking to Mr. Bennett here earlier, um, and Mr. Bennett grew up, can I say this? Mr. Bennett grew up in Holmes County and was actually a patient of Dr. Mentor's when he was young, um, and remembers Dr. Mentor's uh, doctor's office and the state-of-the-art x-ray machine. We were talking about that earlier that they had. Um, Not state-of-the-art. Uh, He's discarding from Chicago. Well, yes, state-of-the-art perhaps for Dr. Mentor. Um, uh, that's right. Um, but again, the impact on the local community, I think, is was really astounding. So. You are aware that 10 years later in Washington County there were two communities inspired by Providence Farm in part? Uh, what were they? Sir? Uh, what were they called? I, I'm not sure. One if was I know called Strike City oh. near Leland. The other was called Freedom City near Greenville. Fantastic. And they were made up of sharecroppers who had been booted off the land and uh, survived for several years as cooperative farms. That's wonderful. I, I'm not familiar with these communities. Thank you for, for telling me about these. And you say they're partly inspired by, by Delta and Providence. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello. Ed King. Uh, several comments linking things. I was a student at Millsaps when this was closed and students had to particularly talk about it and those of us interested in ministry were pretty horrified. Hmm. Generally the students there thought well we've got to leave Mississippi and never come back. Uh, many of us did come back. I've met Mrs. Booker Holmes County became the strongest civil rights county in the state and still has strength. People I couldn't imagine have been meeting though. In 1963, uh, during the freedom vote and then later with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, I would speak in Holmes County and around the Delta and I had people older than I am now. I had people telling me the stories both of this farm, Bolivar County, and always talking about the Southern Tenant Farmers Union mm -hmm. in Arkansas. And the stories they told was that there was much more violence and bloodshed in Arkansas, and we had to keep that from coming to Mississippi. And I thought that, why didn't I hear about that? I heard about Little Rock. No, they meant probably 20 years earlier then, one of the people who came in 1963 to Mississippi to speak for our campaign was Norman Thomas, who had graduated from Princeton Seminary. Mm -hmm. And again, from one of these Presbyterian, very religious families. And he had knew the history. He was a supporter. He asked what had happened. I didn't know the details. Uh, one other detail about Norman Thomas, now I've had meetings with him later. <laughs> Thomas was almost killed on his trip to Mississippi in 1963 in LaFleur County. Uh, I was there, I was in very poor physical condition then, <laughs> and I had to leave the meeting early to come back to Jackson. I was just too tired. Uh, I may have been the target but they attacked the car that I had been driving in and they were driving Norman Thomas back to Jackson at Tougaloo College to go to the airport. I doubt that they really knew Thomas was there. I think I was the target, but the car was driven off the road 
has happened to many people, many places, but LaFleur County especially. And the driver knew of other stories and saved the life of Norman Thomas by outracing the Klan. Wow. But Thomas was one of the strong supporters as a Christian socialist. Well, uh, what an incredible story. Uh, thanks for pulling on those threads and then tying them together as well. Uh, and for the comment about uh, how strong Holmes County has been in, in terms of civil rights. Um, and Providence, I think, is, is a, a cog in that, but in some ways kind of a small piece of that history. Providence has a really vibrant history of civil rights activism. Um, I know you've done so much archival research for this project, but you've also walked the land of the farms themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can talk about what that experience was like and what you learned from being sort of embedded in a physical place? Um, I, I love this question uh, because I, I wasn't really able to unlock the story until I actually physically visited these farms. I'm a southerner, but I'm from North Carolina. I'm not from Mississippi, and so I had to come down and see the farms for myself. Um, and um, in, in Holmes County at Providence, um, it's, it's, it's wide open and pretty accessible. Um, uh, there's maybe, I know the, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History owns most of that land. Um, there's maybe one private residence um, in the area, at least. Um, and I felt uh, really comfortable being there and walking around and uh, didn't really feel like I was trespassing. <laughs> um, uh, Bolivar was different. Um, Bolivar, the, the place where Delta Cooperative Farm was, I think is privately owned now. Um, you can almost see the Mississippi River from there. Um, and when I was driving around the roads where I thought uh, Delta Cooperative Farm had been, I was, I was tailgated by a, a person in a big pickup truck and a gun rack. Um, and so I didn't stick around very long. Um, and I think that probably influenced how I was, how I thought about that space. And also feeling kind of welcome in Providence and, and um, it's really a majestic piece of property. I don't, I don't know if you feel the same way, Mr. Bennett, but it's, it's beautiful out there. Um, and that, I think, influenced how I wrote about Providence as well. Just a, a random historical comment. There was cooperative farming activity in Holmes County in the 1880s, mm. led by the Southern Alliance, and it was organizing by the Colored Farmers Alliance organizer, uh, whose name was Oliver Cromwell, um, <laughs> that led to the LaFleur massacre. There was a cooperative purchasing arrangement, the Durant Commercial Company, that both the Southern Alliance and the Colored Farmers Alliance supported, and there was some co-op of some sort in Chula as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and that's a great reminder, I think, for all of us and sort of speaks to what I'm saying about how this type of history should be remembered. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, I studied with um, a historian who wrote his first book about socialist cooperatives in the 1800s in Tennessee, uh, in early 1900s. Um, and they were all over. They were in Arkansas, they were in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia. Um, and in some ways that's... Uh, except for maybe some of the folks in this room, that's still a surprising history, right? Thank you all for coming here today. Um, we have copies of the book for sale. Rob will be glad to sign it for you over here. If you have any questions that we didn't have time for, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer those as well. Join us next week for Deanne Stevens. Um, but for now, help me thank Rob Ferguson for this fabulous program. <laughs>